Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. We talk a lot about how the Democrats have done so well in this state. And now for that sad, sad conversation of what the Republicans keep screwing up. To talk about that, a former state legislator, author of The Blueprint, Rob Whitworth, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. How's The Blueprint doing? Blueprint, by the way, is the book that details how the left took over Colorado and mm -hmm. it's, it's Everyone talks around the nation about it, so thank you for writing it. Well, thanks. It's uh, it continues to to um, uh, do well outside of the state. I think people are taking notice of of what happened in Colorado and learning lessons. From if you it. could summarize, the blueprint exposed what your I think, book. I think it showed that once campaign finance reform changed the way that parties and candidates could, or in this case, could not raise money, all that money flowed into outside groups, nonprofits, and those outside groups now have all the influence in election campaigns. And it really started here before it. And, and one side seems to have built that infrastructure a whole yeah, lot better in, than the other. In Colorado, the left uh, figured it out much faster and is still pretty far ahead of the, the right on that. And you know him, you love him from his adorable role on Fox 31 News, mm -hmm. but now he's into writing about doctors. <laughs> Eli Sokol, glad to have you. How are you? Writing for 5280, you did a great expose in this one on, on Dudley Brown and, and uh, um, the Havoc. Who is not a doctor. Who is not a doctor, no. but he's, he's in there. Anyway, let, let, let's get started. I, I want to talk about Vicki Marble since this was fresh. So I'm gone for a few days. I come back, and Vicki Marble said what exactly? I'm trying to, uh, trying to put this on together. On Wednesday, there was a hearing at the Capitol, sort of a summer interim committee on uh, the economy and on poverty. And so a bunch of lawmakers are sitting there talking about that. They heard uh, some statistics about... Um, African Americans and Hispanics having higher uh, poverty rates as a as a whole, uh, and Vicki Marble, Republican senator, first term from Fort Collins, decided to uh, opine and kind of wax philosophical and ramble for about five six minutes about why that is. And she mentioned at one point that you know African Americans they've got uh, high rates of diabetes, but then she said you know by gosh I do love chicken and barbecue and and you know I, I love it. And Rhonda Fields sits on this committee and Rhonda Fields a couple minutes later is an African American Democrat from Aurora as you know let her have it and just said you know we're trying to find real solutions this is not about chicken. And we broke the story first, got tipped to it, wrote about it, and it just blew up. And, it, and now you've got House Democrats raising money on it. Uh, the Denver Post today editorializing uh, that she is, what do they say, finger licking stupid, I think was the title of the editorial. Uh, so it's kind of a small little tempest in a teacup, but it is emblematic of the larger thing we're here to talk about, which is she is a Dudley Brown rubber stamped and approved uh, state house candidate. And there are a number of these folks out there. and. Let's, you know, with incidents like this, they do a lot of uh, reputational damage to the party. Let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about Vicki Mar. Now, I know Vicki. I like Vicki. She's worked with us. She votes the right way. She came to our alcohol, tobacco, and firearms party, the most politically incorrect party ever. And we had a great time. And, and, but we all say stupid things at certain times. I've managed to make a living doing this, but other people... Very impressive. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, I can't do anything else but say <laughs> stupid things. So... For a legislator to say something the wrong way, I mean, was she trying to get across some point that had some legitimacy? And it just... You know, I can't speak to what her motivations were, and I, uh, um, her words speak for themselves. I'm not going to touch that. But I, my reaction as a Republican when I see that is the same reaction when I see Todd Akin, a Senate candidate in Missouri, talk about legitimate rape. All of a sudden... The focus is all on this gaffe or this comment, and the focus is all out of ideas. There's no people are no longer talking about ideas, but it's all about the Republican brand being, being uh, uh, questioned and sullied. And I, it's frustrating as a Republican because the conversation really should be around ideas. Um, and when people make comments like this, uh, you know, people can debate, uh, you know, what the what the motives were and whatnot. But but there's really a there's a, a fact of the matter. And it's frustrating to me that this is what we're talking about instead of the real solutions that we need to offer. There's an image about Republicans, and some Republicans walk right into it. I think it's an incorrect image, but that Republicans want to control people's uteruses, that, they, that they're racist, that they're homophobic, and that they're driven by a social agenda, not an economic agenda. I'm, I'm driven by an economic agenda, but there are some Republicans that these social values matter you're, you're a member of the party. Is, is that mm -hmm. what the party is? Is, are, is it social conservatism? 
Well, and, and do people who are unaffiliated, do they even kind of get the difference? A political party is a coalition of people with different beliefs. That's what political parties have historically been. And when your coalition is large enough to be a majority, then your party will be in a governing position. The problem is, is that the Republican coalition, you'll have social libertarians or social moderates, or you'll have social conservatives, fiscal conservatives. Historically, we're able to cobble together enough votes to win. But in this state in particular, there's been a, um, you know, without putting one side ahead of the other, there's been a conflict between the social libertarians and the social conservatives, and they can't coexist. And they can't coexist, and that manifests itself in divisive, uh, nasty primaries, and in, especially in, in close seats. Once you get through one of these nasty primaries, the eventual winner, be it a social or a moderate, whatever label you want to put on them, is so badly wounded, doesn't have the support of their party, then they can't win in the general election and a Democrat wins. Why, 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 is, why is my team so damn good at this? Compared to the other, it's, it seems like well, those Rob's gaps. book is about how the Democrats built this big tent, and it's a very well-funded group underneath that tent. But they do everything, and, and they coexist pretty. You know, they, it's, there's a lot of harmony under that tent. Mm -hmm. On the Republican side, that doesn't exist, and part of that is because the Republicans haven't built an infrastructure like that that compares. Uh, in our state, demographics are obviously a, another piece that we probably won't talk about as much today. But that's a big piece of the political shift of the last decade. But on the right, and what we talk about in this in the story about Dudley Brown is, I don't know that people have ever really realized the influence that he wields because he has amassed enough power among those social conservatives, among people who vote on guns number one, or among people who vote on social issues like abortion, personhood number one. What, let's, and he, let's not jump ahead. Give me, for those who don't know, who's Dudley Brown? Why did you sure. decide to, to to write an article? Why did you quit Fox 31 so you could write <laughs> this stuff? I, I did not quit. Um, oh, you got fired. I, I That's still, what it <laughs> Uh, not that I know of, but I'll check right. my key no, but cards. No, still I mean, as a this newspaper is, reporter, do a long you piece. Can't, in, you can't in, do. Um, I've covered politics here long enough, and, and, and you get a um, you get a sense of the, the sort of bigger stories that are going on, the things that might make a really interesting book or magazine piece, and you can't do them on TV. You just you can't do them in, in two minutes. Um, and so this was one of those stories. Dudley Brown is the head of Rocky Mountain Gun Owners. That's a nonprofit group, right? Everything's a nonprofit these days. The same kind of groups that are on the left that are, you know, making their infrastructure kind of hum. He has a group, and he's built a membership base. So many, I mean, I, I, tens of thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands of people on this list. It's a national list, um, and he has raised a ton of money. And a lot of it is around the gun issue, uh, but he stirs things up. He gets people riled up. He sends them emails. He says, this is crazy. You won't believe what's going on. By the way, send me $20. And over wait, wait, the course that, of that time. sounds just like me. Yeah, well, maybe you should take his course, because he's doing, uh, I mean, obviously, you're doing uh, a lot of stuff at the Independence Institute as well, but he has uh, decided to take a lot of the money that he has, and instead of running ballot measures or, or, or you know putting it to use in certain places, he's directed most of that money in Colorado towards Republican primaries, and so he's really pushed a lot of those primary races. He's gotten behind the candidate on the far right, a candidate like Vicky Marble. He gets them through, um, and you know Vicky Marble takes out was Glenn Vod. Mm -hmm. Glenn Vod got like uh, Lawmaker of the Year from I believe um, from Alec. American a very, legislative a very conservative group, and he was out because he wasn't a Dudley person. So Dudley right, installed Let me you up there for a second. Let me see if I, if I got the, the, the pieces of this puzzle right. So we've got a problem here in that Republicans aren't attractive to, to unaffiliated voters because they're seen as social conservatives. These social conservatives get involved in uh, the primaries where we Republicans savage each other, making it easier uh, to, uh, for the other side to win. And you're saying at, at the center of this, Dudley Brown, who's been around for a long, long time is one of the major players in making those very divisive um, uh, Senate primaries yeah, he's or, a, or uh, primaries. He's a puppet master of sorts. He finds people who will pledge allegiance to him on guns and on most other issues, and he helps them. And, and, and you know, party county assemblies and districts, he gets people, these very small groups, he can kind of stack the deck and then get his people in there, get somebody through a primary, and then they're going to win because they're going to win the general election. So he has a track record he'll boast of winning, you know, getting his people to win. But they either get to Denver and they embarrass the Republicans as a whole, or he doesn't help the people who are running in, in important swing races and they lose to Democrats. He's basically, uh, a lot of folks, and, and Rob is one of them, a lot of Republicans in researching this piece complain to me that they feel like this guy has amassed a lot of power, but he's wielded it to help himself and to put people in place who are loyal to him, and he's shrunk the party. He's made a Republican are you, party are you telling me smaller. Are you telling me that Dudley Brown will raise money on the gun issue 
but spend it on other issues, social issues. Yes, I am. And he's done it. He did it. I mean, Gene White's primary with Randy Baumgartner, he did a mailer. He's getting sued now by the Southern Poverty Law Center for this because he misappropriated a picture of two, uh, two men kissing, put some pine trees behind it, sent it to all the people in the district, and said, Senator Gene White's idea of family values. Now, he got another group to do it in Virginia that basically does the same thing that he does, but in another state. And he sent him the money. He counseled him on what to do. There's emails showing all this. And those emails went out. Randy Baumgartner won this primary. Gene White's gone. Um, but, you know, those are the tactics. And he'll say, well, it's all about achieving the end and putting someone in place who's better on guns. Gene White, you know, was but, never going to vote against the gun bills. It was just that he couldn't really control her. Let me, let me play the other side. This is a system where you can run people in primaries. Mm -hmm. Now, the Democrats have their stuff together. Hickenlooper had no primary. Before that, a pro-life Catholic, Bill Ritter, had no primary. I don't yeah. know how that happens in a Democratic... Former prosecutor. Yeah, I don't know yeah. how that happens in a Democratic primary. But in both cases, we savage each other. We had Bob Beaupre and mm -hmm. Mark Holtzman, good guys, killing each other and doing the Democrats' mm -hmm. work. And then we had the whole fiasco with Scott McGinnis and uh, Dan Mays and mm -hmm. then Tom Tancredo last time. But don't the Dudleys of the world and the social conservatives have every right to be involved in this process? What, what would you change? Well, n nobody's saying people don't have a right to be involved. A good primary is a, is a terrific way of getting out issues. It can publicize candidates. It can put into sharp focus issues. I think the, 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 the issue that a lot of Republicans are asking is, you want to get in a position of governing. You want to have a majority. You know, in politics, you're either at the table or you're on the menu, as as a former state senate candidate Lang Sias said. Uh, you know, there there is a um, there's a real problem with this constant focus on shredding each other in the primary to the point where you're not viable in the general election. I was talking to a former Colorado legislator uh, a while back, and he, he was elected in 1978. He was a group, a part of a group called the House Crazies. They were uh, self-proclaimed right-wing conservatives, uh, proud of it. And he made the point that in 1985 and 1986, the, the, the House and Senate Republicans had a veto-proof majority in the Capitol. And he said, you know, we had a bunch of guys in our caucus who were guys and gals who were, he said, we didn't use the word rhinos, Republicans in name only back in those days, but they were, we thought they were soft, we thought they were uh, flaky, but when we needed to override one of Dick Lamb's vetoes when he was governor, they were there for us. And they overrode two dozen of Governor Lamb's vetoes. He recognized and was pointing out, and the point of his story was, in order to have that kind of a, of a not just a, a veto-proof majority, but a majority at all, you have to be willing to accept that there are different parts of the state, that people are going to be different, that a, a legislator from Evergreen and a legislator from Fort Collins and a legislator from Grand Junction and Colorado Springs are going to have different constituencies that they they have to serve and they're going to vote a little differently and you have to be willing to accept that within your caucus. The problem is this one-size-fits-all mentality where uh, people from outside of these legislative districts come in and try to impose a, a set of litmus test issues that is, has to be good for that, that district. It's not always going to work and when you try to force that into a local race, then you're going to end up getting the blowback. You're going to end up getting Democrats elected in, in districts where the, the voting, voter registration favors Republicans. This is exactly what we saw this year. That's why we mm -hmm. had the, the wildest legislative session I've, I've ever seen in Colorado with more leftist uh, policies passed. And they win. The price of losing an election is, is real. Let me, let, me, let me ask you about, you, you mentioned the big tent that the Democrats seem to have. And I think about social conservatives and fiscal conservatives and the natural tension they have. With the Green Party, there is no more Green Party in Colorado. Mm -hmm. they, they had their day, and the left just embraced all their issues and made them their own, from uh, fracking to whatever. They brought that, that in. Libertarians, their ideas certainly were not embraced by the Republican Party, so they still feel like, like outsiders. Is there any way for Republicans to, to pull this stuff together? You, well, I mean, you, you I, get they, to see they it. have to, they have to. I, I think, you know, you're right. I mean, Democrats, this year, the governor did nothing for the environmentalists, basically. He wanted to, but he wouldn't go as far as they wanted to. It's a big fight. And at the end of the day, nobody's getting primaried over that. The, the sponsors of the bills are out in Boulder. They did what their constituents wanted them to do. But, you know, they've been pretty quiet. So, so yeah, either they've they, they either got a more functional system um, 
or they're just more focused on maintaining a majority and, and maintaining that harmony within the party. Rob mentioned Lang Sias. Lang Sias last year was a guy, and he's mentioned in this story, he was running against Evie Hudak in a Senate race that's probably the biggest Senate race. Now, she had a ton of teachers' union support, uh, a lot of money, but Lang Sias is a pretty solid Republican candidate, you know, former fighter pilot. Uh, he's the kind of candidate that a lot of people in the party look at and say, he's what we want. He gets in there. Uh, loses by about 340 votes. There's a libertarian in there who, you know, who, who siphoned off some votes that may have siphoned been the off difference. Siphoned 5,000 votes. But, made listen, it, but, made but, but here's the story. Dudley Brown, I said, why didn't you support Lang Sias? He said, I wanted to, but he wouldn't fill out my questionnaire. He, wouldn't, he was advised not to fill out my questionnaire, and Dudley gets incensed when other Republicans, Bill Cadman in this case, the Senate uh, Minority Leader, says, don't do that, it's not going to help you in that race. And Rob's right, it's not a one-size-fits-all thing, it's not a single-issue uh, race, but, you know, Dudley has a lot of muscle. If Dudley got involved and, and, and got behind Lang Sias, I mean, who's to say? What happened in the end is these gun bills, they passed the Senate, a huge fight in the Senate, and the two big ones passed by one vote. So think about it. Right? A couple Democrats split and voted with the Republicans. One more seat the Republicans have, mm -hmm. and those bills are dead. And that's the ultimate irony of the story, is that this last session, we saw Democratic majorities, sort of built by Democrats, but with some help from Dudley Brown, pass the legislation that this guy has spent his entire career fighting against. And you, know, you can say, oh, I've been successful, most of my people get through primaries, you know, I, this is what I believe and I'm doing, and he certainly has that right. But if the game is building majorities and actually governing, it's been very destructive. Independence Institute, we say freedom is a team sport. You know, that we've got to pull these people together. And the left does it all the time, but our, we just can't, can't do it. And I think about what it is to you. Let's, let's talk about governor, what it is to run for governor. There used to be a time, and I'm now old enough to remember, that if you run for governor and you lose, your personal stock, your political stock, goes up. People remember you, you're mm -hmm. part of it, you're an active citizen, you did your duty. I think of guys like John Andrews, who ran against Roy mm -hmm. Romer, and you know, this was good for his ideas, and it was good for John Andrews, and it was a good campaign. That doesn't happen anymore. Look at Scott McGinnis. He was the favorite candidate. He, um, he was charged with plagiarism, which he was then vindicated from, but he l was at, a, at Brownstein Hyatt Farber, the biggest law firm in town. He was pulling down half a million if he was pulling down a dime, and now he's the head of some association somewhere on the Western Slope. You know, it's not that you just lose the election, you can lose your career. So only people like, like um, Hickenlooper, who has, has the businesses to, to support him, can really run anymore. Am I, am I wrong on this? Well, if, if what you're saying is that, that campaigns are more negative, uh, I absolutely agree that that's the case. And I don't think that's an accident. And people say, well, campaigns have historically been negative. And there, there were uh, political cartoons of Abraham Lincoln right. depicting him like a, a monkey and that kind of thing. But the, the uh, so campaigns have been nasty and negative. This was the first time Democrats got involved in a Republican primary. So you yeah. have Dan Mays there, but if I can and, go, and you, what was it, $250,000? Oh, it was more than that, it was well, a half million. Yeah. And, but, but my point is, and I'm sorry it took a while to get to it, but it's because the money has flowed to these outside groups. When you're a candidate or you're a political party and you're putting out there a vile, toxic, nasty message, the voters are gonna retaliate against you. They're gonna say, I don't like your brand of, of gutter politics, you're out. But when you, when you run it through these nonprofits with names like Coloradans for, for Progress or Coloradans for Freedom, which was the name of the group that they, they funded up to, <laughs> to oppose um, McGinnis, then there's no accountability. All that, all that lingers afterwards is the nasty negative message. And it, it, that's all that hangs around. And so you've gotten to the point where these outside groups can say just about anything about anybody and get away with it and it and it's just it is destroying our political culture it is destroying the fabric of dialogue at the Capitol and it is affecting negatively the quality of our leadership the point being that candidates don't run their campaigns no they, they have very little to do they, with them anymore all, all they can do is knock on doors and make a few phone calls the real money thanks to these campaign finance laws is since you can't give to a candidate you give to independent expenditures. Mm -hmm. Karen Crummy at the Post uh, a little while ago did a did a uh, edition of it all in the last race. Democrats outspent Republicans 150 to 1 in independent expenditures. They know how to use these rules. We don't. Uh, this when when Tim Gill's money, that machine went into the primary against 
Um, but I'm sorry, can I? Yeah, go ahead. You know, you, that's true, but you know, you have outside organizations like this. It's not just having the money, but it's how you spend it. It's it's spending it ineffectively in ways that destroy your own party. Uh, you know, the circular firing squad, or it's it's spending it in ways that that advance your party. And the thing that that's really clear to me about uh, the the groups on the left is that they coordinate with each other and they work towards a common purpose, which is electing Democrats. And they don't all agree with each other necessarily, but they. They will, they will focus on the common purpose of winning elections, and then they'll, they'll uh, fight with each other after they get the majority about what kind of policies they want to enact. But when it comes to those elections, they are all on the same page. I would submit that it's not, it's not necessarily the case on, the, on our side right now. And I would point out a couple of points. Carl Rove spent $600 million through his PAC last cycle. So, I mean, Republicans know how to play this game, too. But it, it has not sort of... in Colorado, they Not in Colorado. It's a unique place. But, you know, Dudley Brown knows how to play the game. But certainly, the, the rise of these outside groups have rendered campaigns, candidates, and political parties, state parties, relatively impotent by comparison. What, what drew you to this story? Why, you know, why would you spend your I've time on this one? I've been sitting here for... I've been in Colorado eight years covering politics, and all I've seen every cycle is Republicans losing. I mean, 2010 was like, how do you blow 2010? And I think yeah. it's, it's fair to point out that Scott McGinnis, yes, it does. It, it is easier for somebody of means who's really rich to get into office and run a campaign and not have to worry about, you know, paying the bills, whatever. But, you know, I mean, see Jared Polis and, a, you know, hundreds of other examples. But, you know, Scott McGinnis was a pretty unique case. He would not, if, if he'd ran that campaign to the distance and he'd lost by a couple points, he'd be right back at that law firm making half a million dollars a year and he'd be fine. So he went down spectacularly in flames. And that doesn't always happen. In this state, the Democrats are pretty good at making sure that does happen. Ken Buck, he was a DA. He went back to being DA. Now he's running for Senate. But what drew me to the article is you see cycle after cycle in a state where supposedly both sides should have a chance every year because there's all these unaffiliated voters. And why aren't Republicans making the, making the sale to those voters in the middle, right? The Jeffco, Arapaho, those swing voters, Larimer County, those moms. What is going on? Why don't these people appeal? And there's a common thread. And the common thread between Ken Buck and between, you know, the... the the House majority, the Republican House majority that screwed up on civil unions and lost the majority. I mean, all these defeats, in a lot of cases, you can go back, losing the House in 2004, which is detailed in Rob's book, you can draw, you can kind of connect these dots. And there are instances in which this guy who runs a gun organization that most people couldn't pick out of a lineup, even lawmakers at the Capitol, tell me, I don't even know what he looks like. But this guy, for almost two decades, has has been a behind the scenes player and a pretty impactful one and he's really made it he's made it hard for the Republican party to really grow and open itself up and appeal to those people who in a state like this you really need to win statewide races who cares if you win a couple states you know if you put who you want in a couple of state house seats from Weld County good for you that's not that hard but winning a statewide race here is hard Conjecture for me, what's more important to Dudley Brown? He runs gun owners, uh, the Rocky Mountain gun owners, but he seems to be more motivated by the anti-gay agenda than, than other things. Is, is it really guns or is it social issues? Oh, it's, it's guns. He's a gun guy. Uh, but so he I. feels very strongly about a lot of things. And he'll tell you straight to your face, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, this is my organization, I raise money on guns, but you know what, I'm going to volunteer my, you know, my time and my staff, and I'm going to spend my money as I see fit, and I'm going to be involved in a host of other issues that, are, that matter to me. And, and the social issues are really kind of the, the obvious ones where he decides to, to play. But, you know, he, it, it's hard to track the money, too. So he can say, oh, my staff volunteered for that. We did it on a voluntary basis. But, you know, he's printing out mailers on his machinery that he pays for with you know, this, these staffers are probably not doing stuff on their own. I mean, I've talked to people who say nobody in that office does anything, goes to the bathroom without asking Dudley's permission. So it's all very um, orchestrated and coordinated and also kind of hard to, it, it's, it's murky. You know, is this, is this an official thing that RMGO is doing with RMGO money or is it a volunteer thing? Or, you We've know? got a couple minutes left. Let, let's go forward. We've got a big year coming up. Uh, we don't have a presidential election. Pot's not going to be on the <clears> ballot. But... Hickenlooper is working his way to being vulnerable. A half a year ago, I would say he, he, there's no way anyone could beat him. But after, after what he did on taxes and regulations, what he did to small businesses, what he did on um, uh, what he didn't do with Nathan Dunlap, refusing to make a decision, kicking it to the next governor, uh, with the gun laws, 
with the recalls that are coming and perhaps this fall with his tax increase maybe not making it he becomes very very beatable except we we got to get republicans together now we've got about four or five guys thinking what what's the lesson here give give the sage advice what is it that republicans need to demand of the, of their candidates going into these primaries well I, you know, you can't beat something with nothing right it's enough to say that it's not enough to say that your opponent's weak and that he's you know that there's all these issues that they're going to to hurt him in a general election you have to have a strong candidate to oppose him with and for a long time it's been enough to republicans to say oh you know Obama, look at all he's did in his first term. We're just going to beat him. We'll be able to beat him on the strength that you know people are going to be frustrated. They're going to lash out. You got to have something, and um, there has to be unity. It's not just having a good candidate. It's not be, just having somebody who appears sympathetic and understands what they're talking about. Doesn't get get bogged down in gaffes, but they're talking in substance. It's frustrating that they're not driven, that they're not focused, that they're not disciplined. Uh, if you find somebody who's focused and driven and disciplined and has a message and knows what they're talking about. And, and communicates with the people who are not necessarily partisan one way or the other. Here's how, here's how I diagnose the problems and here's what I would suggest to solve them. That's what it's gonna take. But this, this idea that he, you know, they're vulnerable, uh -huh. we'll beat them, that, that well, doesn't fly. This. Republicans love getting behind a person. Mm -hmm. I think Democrats, as a generalization, love getting behind ideas. Ideas, yeah. ideas win. 30 seconds, what do Republicans need to know? Um, I just think they need to be aware. They need to know, know who's, who's sort of dividing the party and they need to decide what's more important. Are issues more important to me or do I want majorities and do I want Republicans back in a position where they actually can influence what goes on and they can govern? Eli, thank you. Check out the latest copy of 5280. Check out the blueprint. Go to Amazon. Listen to KHOW Radio for me. Tell a friend about the Independence Institute. We'll see you next week.